Recall from a preceding lesson for a modal analysis, we're assuming harmonic motion for every point of the structure. So let's write the displacement harmonic form. We use phi to be the amplitude, omega is the angular frequency, and theta is the phase angle. We take two derivatives of the displacement with respect to time, and that will give us the acceleration. Previously, our unknowns are displacement and acceleration, but now we transform them, so our unknowns are the amplitude phi and the angular frequency omega and the phase angle theta. Now let's replace displacement and acceleration with these two harmonic equations by substituting our harmonic expression of displacement into our governing equation of motion. We will find that the sinusoidal terms for phase angle are dropped here, and the equation of motion is now simply in terms of only angular frequency, omega, and amplitude phi. This is a typical eigenvalue problem. Now, a trivial solution to this equation would be that phi is equal to zero. That's not very meaningful. So the meaningful or non-trivial solution and the way we solve it is to set the determinant of the matrix inside the brackets to be equal to zero. We know the stiffness matrix K and the mass matrix M, so solving the determinant will find the square of omega. Taking the square root will give us the eigenvalues or the angular frequencies omega. There will actually be an angular frequency for every degree of freedom in the system. With the omegas computed, returning to the governing equation of motion, we can now compute the eigenvectors, or mode shapes phi. It is important to note that omega is the angular frequency, and it is related to the natural frequency by the simple relationship of 2 pi. In the practice of modal analysis, we will typically be interested in and in reporting the natural frequency as it has the units of interest of hertz, or cycles per second, rather than the angular frequency, which has units of radians per second. Also, if the mass and stiffness matrix are of n by n dimension, then we can find n eigenvalues, and for each eigenvalue, there's a corresponding eigenvector phi. Here's an example of a simple two degree of freedom spring mass system. There are two degrees of freedom as each mass can move in a single direction, x1 and x2. Our masses and spring stiffnesses are known, and we wish to determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the system. We form the terms of the matrices based on performing a force balance on each mass, so F equals MA, and writing this in the matrix form. We then solve for the determinant, which can be done by hand, a scientific calculator, or more commonly, a computer. Finally, we have the angular frequencies, omega, and the eigenvectors or mode shapes phi. Recall that we typically have one last step, and that is to compute the natural frequencies from the angular frequencies. Most problems in real life and industry are much more complicated than the spring mass system, and modal analysis of them are not possible to be solved by a hand calculator. Numerical methods, such as the finite element method, are used to find modal analysis results. Using finite element software, engineers can request the desired number of modes or natural frequencies to be computed for the structure, as typically we are looking at a subset of all the modes. Some structures may have millions of degrees of freedom, and we won't typically be concerned with all of them. Engineers can then also visualize the mode shapes corresponding to each natural frequency. As an example of something more complex, let's have a quick look at the wind turbine blade. While we may think such a large blade would be rigid, it is actually flexible. And while hard to see, the wind blade does deform to excitations such as wind gusts. Making the blade excessively stiff is not necessary and adds to the weight and cost of the blade. So here we see just three of the many modes of this wind blade. The first mode is the first normal bending mode, also known as the flapwise bending mode, and its natural frequency in this case is close to 3 Hz. This means if we went to the tip of the blade, pulled it down and let go, the tip would oscillate in harmonic motion as we have described previously. The tip would go up, then down, and return to the up position three times in one second. Now the second mode is the first edgewise bending mode, and it has a natural frequency of around 5 Hz. The blade is appreciably stiffer in the edgewise direction compared to the normal direction, and hence we have a higher frequency. The third mode is the second flapwise bending mode at around 8 Hz, and we can see that with higher frequencies, 
we start to get more complex modes of deformation. So again, how many modes will a structure have? Theoretically, the number of modes that we can extract from a structure equals the number of degrees of freedom of the model, or in other words, the size of the system matrix. For the hand-calculated spring mass system, there are two degrees of freedom, therefore, there are two natural frequencies. For the wind turbine blade, the structure is solved by finite element software with over a thousand degrees of freedom, in this case, so there are over a thousand modes that can be calculated. However, very rarely do engineers need to find all the modes of a structure. In fact, depending on the frequency range of the load the structure will be subjected to in actual operation, engineers choose that range of natural frequencies that need to be calculated. High frequency modes may be limited and have limited effect in the dynamic behavior of the structure unless of course the excitation frequency is also high or we need them to capture the rigid body behavior. In any case, which modes are needed depends on the structure and the loading environment. Let's try to illustrate this concept a bit further. If you were concerned with the dynamic behavior of a car body as it passed over a single bump at nominal speed as shown here, we'd only need the lower natural frequencies of the car body to capture the dynamic response. But if we were concerned how the body or other parts of the car might resonate to the excitation of, say, loud music, or even driving over a very rough road with lots of bumps, and since the excitation is at a higher frequency, we would want to extract the higher frequency modes to be able to capture their response in the follow-on dynamic simulation. Mode shapes represent the relative deformation of the structure, not the absolute value. Again, mode shapes are eigenvectors of the system, which are essentially vectors. Vectors representation directions in the coordinate system, and the value of the components are not absolute. For modal analysis, mode shape 3210 and 6420 are the same mode shape. Although the deformation plot seems different, the relative deformation is the same between the degrees of freedom. I can pick a single scalar number like 2 in this case, multiply it by the first vector, and that gives me the second vector. For a realistic modal analysis, mode shapes can be plotted in different scales, but still representing the same mode shape. So, the absolute magnitude of the deformation in the modal analysis has no meaning. 